I went too far. I have to apologize to a druid. Welcome back. Last episode of this series highlighting EverQuest Yelenak Timelock Progression Server. Des will not have a punishment for this episode because it's time to raid and you die a lot raiding. So how does it go? Wow. Doesn't seem like much, but this is over 100 people on a game, mind you, that's over 20 years old. We're doing Plane of Fear. A zone so difficult on release that I heard GMs had to intervene. The number one guild wiped going in, they made an attempt to recover but wiped again, and their corpses were going to rot soon. So they asked for help from the number two guild on the server, they went in and also wiped. And it got so bad that GMs had to clear the zone so these people could recover their corpses before all their gear was lost. It was that bad. The zone has a really rough entry, and the strategy is usually for a bard or monk to train away the mobs at the entrance so the raid force can move in. And these mobs have a bunch of nasty effects. That's why you generally want a bard because they can stack magic resist. As soon as you're in, the body of the raid force goes to the west wall and you start clearing all the trash. The god of fear himself, Kazakh Thule, resides here in the Plain of Fear. Its rough terrain and blood red sky are indicative of the horrors that await those who dare to venture within. Death touching golems, shadow stepping scarelings, mass dispelling tentacle terrors, and evil eyes, blinding nightmares, and other vicious creatures are just a few of the denizens which serve Kazakh Thule and which look to destroy any mortals foolish enough to trespass into their realm. This zone is just chock full of nasty trash mobs like the lore indicates. Normally on most raids, you try to skip past trash mobs, it slows you down, but try that in Plane of Fear, you're gonna regret it at the end. First boss fight, how does it go? Wrong. There are five bosses in this zone, and we just pulled three on accident. Three golem bosses aggro, and this should be a wipe. And I'm, I'm getting rock golem flashbacks again. These golems are difficult because two of them death touch. In many classic raids, bosses will instantly kill whoever they're targeting, generally every like 30 to 45 seconds or so. Fun mechanic. You pick a dedicated tank to take the hits, and then in the last few seconds before the death touch goes off, off tanks try to rip aggro away, so they take the death touch instead of the main tank. And DPS try to burn down the golems before the tanks all die and the healers run out of mana. Not hard, except there's three right now. First priority, kill the two death touching golems ASAP. Death touchers are gone. Last golem is just a tank and spank. He's got a lot more hit points than his buddies, and he hits a lot harder, but there's no curveballs at all. And you'll notice all these apes and zombies also attacking the boss. Enchanter pets. Enchanters are the top tier DPS in early raids because charm is just that friggin' powerful. So we beat all three golems. These guys drop necessary pieces for the warrior and necromancer epics. Next is probably the second hardest raid mob in Classic, Dracolich. Bards are really important for this fight because of two curveballs. It'll do an AoE fear every 30 seconds or so, magic based, bards stack magic resist to stop the fear from landing, and it's really important that the main tank doesn't go running off because Dracolich will follow. The second curveball is the worst. Also, every 30 seconds or so, Dracolich will do an AoE disease dot that just shreds hit points. Bard stack disease resist for that. Why is this fight considered the second hardest? This fight is basically a race. Everyone is quickly dying from the disease dot. Healers are running out of mana fast trying to keep everyone alive. DPSers need to take down Dracolich before healers are empty, but the DPSers keep getting feared and kicked out of combat. My job is just to stay alive for as long as possible and play resist. So I try to twist in some extra hit point regen to slow down the dot's damage, 
fight is pretty tough. A lot of people die. Now time for a god. The last boss, Kazakh Thul. I said you have to kill all the trash in this zone. Why? Kazakh Thul. When you engage him, he will summon every mob in zone to help him. He's tough alone, but add 50 mobs and good luck. You have to clear out the trash. But if you can do Draculich, you can do Kazakh. He's, he's not a pushover, but he's not as hard. Kazakh death touches every 30 seconds, and he also does an AoE dispel and knockback. It flings you halfway across the zone, and it also takes away your best buffs. Bards on this fight typically play Levitation, because a lot of people take big fall damage on the knockback, and Levitate helps mitigate that. Tanks were dropping like flies, and the death touches didn't help either. But somehow we pull through, and I think this was server first. First Kazakh fool kill on Yelena. Now, let's go for another god. The Plane of Hate is home to the creator of the Dark Elves, the Prince of Hate, Inarok. Also calling this plane home are an assortment of ghouls, vampires, gargoyles, and undead dragons. The plane itself is like a massive city of organized streets and buildings set in such a way to confuse invaders. This zone has many targets. There's two big bosses and then a bunch of mini bosses. Let's show some of these mini bosses while I discuss the next big topic of this video series. So I've talked about problems with P99 and TLP. Now let's talk about the biggest issues with EverQuest Live. These are servers that are on the most current expansion, like the 28th or something. And disclaimer, I have played on Live for a few months, but I'm not as familiar with the end content on those servers. Problem one, this is by far the least social version of EverQuest. It's gonna be a ghost town until you hit level 100s. That is if you can even get there. It starts to get really difficult around the 80s to 90s, even with a mercenary. And the game's free to play, but the limitations start to really set in around then. In my opinion, Live is by far the loneliest and longest journey to max level. I've touched on this before, but there's no reason to group with lower level players. There is nothing a higher level player gets out of it. And it makes leveling up a very lonely experience. And this game was not meant to be played alone. It sucks solo. I would never play EverQuest if soloing was the only option. There's so many better games for that. And also, it's hard to play this game with your friends if you two have a big level gap. There's nothing this game does to fix that issue. Problem number two, Everything is unlocked on these servers. All zones are available, except it's an illusion. Outside of epic quests and certain niche items, there's almost no reason to revisit any older zone. They have no loot that's better than Defiant, and Defiant armors were put in to help players keep appropriately geared up. Generally, you could say 80% of the zones that have been put into this game, this game is gigantic, they're just not used or they're inefficient. These zones are slower leveling compared to heroic adventure quests. And then there's this one period, generally like from level 75 to 100, where the absolute best way to do it is just to do a quest line called Gribble Task over and over and over again. The developers put in so much effort to make hundreds of unique zones, but there's no reason at all to use them. So if you wanted to fix EverQuest problems, what would you do? So I've talked about P99, TLPs, and now Live's problems, all their biggest issues. Let me know what you guys would do to fix them. Okay, so I think two changes would make Project 1999 the absolute best way to play EverQuest, hands down. The first change, P99 is a dead-end server. It will never go past Velius, so all the work you do there is completely worthless. Getting the epic and getting all the best raid armor, 
absolutely no further progression past that. What if P99 worked with Daybreak to create a service where you could copy your maxed out P99 character onto a live or post Velius TLP for a large fee so that all the work you put into your character there on P99 could continue on. And that fixes one problem. And solution number two, I think the absolute best change to P99 would be instancing like you see on TLBs. Instance grouping zones for overcrowding, instance raids so end content and epics aren't limited by scarcity. Scarcity does not make the game harder, it just makes the game inaccessible. Let everyone try to kill Talondor. Let skill be the deciding factor, not scarcity. Now, I don't know how feasible this is because I think it takes more server architecture and more money to do this, but if it was possible, I think instancing would fix the absolute biggest problem P99 has. Now, if I were to fix EverQuest Live and TLPs, this is what I would do. First solution, if I was trying to limit the effect of Chrono Farmers, there's two options that can be done right now, without Daybreak losing money or creating new code. One option was the Mischief server. Randomized loot and free trade made it so that monopolizing camps was completely irrelevant. You could get funky tunics and zones other than Sebelis, and this went for all high value pieces. Chrono Farmers couldn't monopolize items. Awesome. Option two hasn't been tried, but I think it easily could. Not every server can be free trade or mischief. Say, make another server like Yelenak that's not free trade, but double the loot that drops. Also reduce the raid instance lockouts from seven days to three. This would help out players. See, TLPs are in such an accelerated timeline that getting geared is hard. Doubling the loot helps players get geared and it also inflate the market so that Chrono Farmers can't charge as much for abundant bottleneck items. It would be less profitable. And I don't think Daybreak can or financially wants to stop the Chrono Farmers. So why not make a server where Chrono Farmers can't monopolize so damn hard? These aren't complete solutions, but I think they're the best solutions given what we have right now. Solution number two, EverQuest's best feature is how social it is. All efforts should go to maintain that. Lower levels are often a ghost town on later servers, on live servers. I feel that max level players should be given a reason to group and help lower level players. Perhaps retool the monster shroud system. Max level players could earn alternate advancement experience for grouping with lower level players. But it has to be enough AA experience. Why would you want to shroud down if it gave you crumbs compared to the AA gain you'd get doing max level content? It shouldn't be too much, but it also shouldn't be too little. There needs to be balance there. Daybreak could also add another filter to the LFG window to include willing to shroud down. Solution number three, what about player versus player? PVPers are a very vocal aspect of the community, but doing PVP using people's real characters can't be balanced and is patently unfair. I think this is from Josh Strife Hayes. He talked about Lord of the Rings Online. I think the best way to include a viable PvP system would be to retool the monster shrouds again. So you select what level 50 monster and class you want to PvP as. So this makes the playing field fair. You can choose any class. And then you get sent to an instance of the arena zone. If you win in competition against say 6 to 12 other players, you earn varying AA and earn your way to exclusive titles. Say like first place gets 10 AA, second place gets five, third place gets three. I think there needs to be a 24 hour lockout though, so people don't exploit it for easy experience. I can see people boxing to do that. And your character must also be level 60 minimum to enter. Basically, you don't want people to roll five other level one boxes just so they can cheese the system over and over and earn AA. The lockouts and level restrictions curb that. They make other pathways more efficient. Number four, the last change I would suggest. Make old zones worth using again by this. So say you shroud down from level 100 to 15 to group with some lobies and crush bone. You earn 15 AA points for the first time ever in that zone while you're grouping with those guys. 
then you should be given a bonus 5 AA points as a reward. There should be a reward, there should be an incentive when people try out zones they've never used before. For raids, say you shroud down to 50 to help out some lobies take down Vox for an epic quest. First time you complete that raid, you should get 5 AA, and then subsequent clears give you 3 AA. This encourages people to check out old content, and it also rewards players to redo old raids to help out others who haven't done them or need them for quest progression. But enough hypothetical crap, let's get back to the content. So Plane of Hate has a bunch of mini bosses that are essentially tank and spank fights. Some have exceptional loot. The Magi drops the part for the Magician Epic. The Lord of Ire drops one of the most valuable pieces of loot this era, Shield of the Immaculate, Instaclick Disease Cure Shield. And the last notable one being from Coercer Tivala. Very rare item, Clicky Clarity with infinite charges, mana regen. Now onto the real bosses. Maestro of Rancor. Used to be a mortal named Videl Revnal, filling up the plane of hate with his haunting song. He's a tough fight for melees. Every few seconds he'll do an AoE life tap that'll refill his health. Melee have to stand just perfectly or they'll be hit by the life tap. And if he keeps life tapping the melees, the fight will only end in failure. I'm standing farther back because my job is to stay alive here, not DPS. Once Maestro dies, his hand detaches and you kill it to get a necessary part for the warrior epic. And now, for the Prince of Hate, Inarook. This fight has two mechanics. It's basically Kazakh Thule all over again. Inarook death touches every 30 seconds, and he also does an AoE dispel and knockback. So bards will typically play magic resist and levitate to help out. And again, my job during this fight is just to stay alive. So I stick behind this corner so I don't strain the healers and position just right so my tanks keep getting my buffs. The dispels keep ripping off the enchanter charms so I end up picking up a loose pet to great effect. Oftentimes the enchanter pets go wild so it's important as a bar to keep on your toes and help out. You don't want these pets going loose in camp. raid finished and the next day I got so angry that I went too far. As you've seen with these raid bosses, many of them dispel you. It's really important to protect your hit point and resist buffs. You do not want them lost. So how do you protect them? Junk buffs. You put junk buffs before your valuable ones. So they're the ones that get dispelled first and then you just refresh them real quick. The best junk buffs are from Instaclick items, and there's only two in Classic. The best one is Journeyman Boots, an Instaclick run speed buff, but this quest has a bottleneck item called the Ring of the Ancients. This item drops from a mob called the Ancient Cyclops, or AC. Most people go to Sea Fury Island in Ocean of Tears to try to spawn him. Killing any one of the Cyclops here give you a very rare chance to pop the name. Sea Fury Isle is one of the most toxic camps in the entire game. I actually have a story video about being cursed out on the EQ forums for what happened here. So the Ring of the Ancients is a crazy bottleneck item. Every class that doesn't have a run speed buff wants it, and even classes with run speed buffs want it for raids. Basically all raiders want this item. And that creates some of the most intense competition you'll ever see on the server. All decency is gone when the Ancient Cyclops pops. I saw it too. Now, when I did this on Mangler years ago, it was trivial if you had charm. When this mob pops, it turns into a giant DPS race, and parts don't win those. So I used to charm the Ancient Cyclops and then run far away, run to an island on the other side of the zone so that no one could kill steal it from me. If it did pop near me, I was guaranteed to get the kill, but in the years since Mangler, something has changed. I got lucky, and it popped right on me. 
I was the first to engage. I cast a charm and got the text. This NPC cannot be charmed. Charm got patched away. I did my best to spit out DPS. I charmed another Cyclops and sicked it on the named, and I spat out every die I had. And what do you know? There's a Druid and Necro right there to mop up. The Necro engages with the Snare Dot, and for some reason the AC goes after a Druid. Weird. The Druid tries to snare it to run away, and eventually the snare lands, but by that time the Necro had its full dot rotation. It was it was too late. The Necro, Junkie Man, kill steel. <laughs> KSing is a dick move. I was so pissed. All I saw was red, and it's time to get revenge. First, the druid. The druid was root rotting the sea furies, so I stuck nearby, waited for her to make a move, and then I proceed to DPS race her just like she did to me. Even if you win the fight, you're gonna burn your whole mana bar. I win it. Then I have a discussion with the druid where I roughly told her, Ancient Cyclops told me that you didn't respect first to engage. It really sucks when people do that to you, doesn't it? The druid said they didn't kill it. The necro did. They got aggroed and tried to snare it to run away for their life. They're not at fault. I went too far. I'm sorry that I did that. Except... When I looked over the footage weeks later, that's not what happened. Let's replay it slow mode. I tried to charm the AC twice, but they fail because of the patch. I switched to charm the other Cyclops to help me out when the DPS raise. During that third charm cast, the Necro starts to cast his Snare Dot. Then the AC aggros onto the Druid. Weird. I land the charm and send the pet to attack. The necro snare dot lands and it rips aggro. The necro starts to run away. And right at that time, you'll see a fire dot lands. Now this could have been the necro. They do have fire dots, except there's two smoking guns. The druid does a casting animation when the dot lands. And aggro rips right back onto the druid. There's only two fire dots that druid could have used. And I would bet good money it was Immolate. Immolate is a fire dot that does strong damage. Great for DPS racing. But also generates a lot of aggro. It's a flame lick line dot that rangers specifically use to hold aggro while tanking. The AC would not have ripped off the necro if the necro did the fire dot. Only the druid could have done that. You lie, druid. You only ran for your life after you threw in a dot to try to kill steal it. You couldn't drop aggro, so you tried to snare it to get away before it beat you senseless. By this time, the druid has all the aggro and is getting beat up. So the druid tries to run away by using snare. Snare lands, they get to safety, and the necro casts a poison dot that also generates crazy aggro. The necro eventually steals aggro and finishes the fight. They had the most dots rolling, so there was nothing the druid or myself could do to win. I rescind my apology. And what's bad is the druid recognized my name. Thought I was impersonating the real Aeonic. Guess what? It was me. And if you watch my videos, you should have known better than to kill steal. When you see this druid, please unsubscribe. You're lying scum. I don't hate druids anymore. I hate players like you. Aeonic is on the warpath today. It's not over yet. Someone else has to pay. I was keeping tabs on the kill stealing necro. He got all the parts to do the J boots turn in. He's gone to raid mountains so I ran to intercept him. The quest NPC has to bootstrutter spawns, 
immediately like when he gets in zone and I hurry everyone to do their turn in that needs to do it before I enact my revenge. I actually see a Termis. I think that's the channel the Brit Canuck plays. I'm sorry we met like this. Everyone gets their J-Boots quest done and now it's my turn to take over. This will probably get nerfed after this video. I term Hasten and guess who runs by? The kill stealing Necro. The thing is, it can take hours for Aston to spawn. It sucks to try to pop him. This Necro could have done his turn in right now and saved himself hours of waiting, but not on my watch scum. I run to a corner of the zone and hold Haston there. Eventually I get bored and just kill him, so the spawn cycle restarts. And the Necro logs off because he knows he ain't getting those J boots when I'm around. You can say I went too far, but I call it vigilante justice, like what Batman does. If Daybreak is not going to police their game, then it's up to players to enact justice. After this, I made a forum post on a junk account. You know, maybe if it's brought to attention, Daybreak will do something. Problem. A lot of toxic behavior on TLP servers deals with camping the ancient Cyclops. Every spawn turns into a kill steal contest that leaves everyone frustrated. So the solution? The issue is the bottleneck. The item only drops off the ancient Cyclops, which is a rare spawn in and of itself. So to fix that bottleneck, say what if all trash Cyclops in the zone could have a rare chance of also dropping the ring? But rare, mind you. That would significantly reduce the bottleneck, and it would reduce the need to DPS race. All classes would have a fair chance of getting the ring. Wouldn't be given to you free, but you could work for it. You could earn it. After that, I tried to end the day on a good note. Train him. Stream sniping Hammock J here. I had a nice two-hander upgrade for him. Former raid targets left and my answer to what is the best way to enjoy EverQuest. Lady Vox, the Frost Dragon, banished from her kin of dragons for plotting with Lord Magafin, the next target to conceive a prismatic dragon, a violation of their law. This fight has three twists. Vox is a cleric that can complete heal herself. Vox also does an AoE fear that I'm playing magic resist for. The last issue is an AoE nuke for 500 damage that also dispels you. Gotta get those junk buffs. I'm in the tank group, so my job again is just to stay alive and play resist, not DPS. Usually the strategy for this fight is to joust, so when the AoEs are coming, the melee will jump behind a wall to avoid getting hit. Only the tank stays in because they have to. I end up charming a loose enchanter pet and add some extra damage. Lord Nagafin. This is the fire version of Vox. Also does AoE fears, does an AoE fire nuke that dispels, so I play magic resist for the tanks and try not to get hit. Melees joust in and out for the AoEs. Now a fight, I actually do something. I think Kedgekeep is one of the most unique zones in EverQuest. It's all underwater, so you need water breathing here. 
and in-game maps are worthless because this is the real X, Y, and Z access zone. All directions are used. Finnegal Atropos, the last known creature of his race, the Kedge. To get access to him, you have to clear these seahorses blocking the way. I use LOL to split this pull apart. It was perfect. Now with the seahorses gone, there's two left and Finny at the bottom. I lull the two at the bottom and then I'm able to pull Finny alone. Beautiful pulling is a bard. I pull with the dispel to take off some of the buffs and the fight is on. This fight got patched recently because I guess Daybreak felt it was too easy. I don't feel that great about it. Finny's only difficulty is that he's a wizard and he'll do some nasty AoE nukes and dispels. And dispels are really bad here because say if your water breathing gets ripped off, you're gonna drown and die. So before the patch, you'd start off the fight by keeping him mezzed and then tap all his mana. Then the fight turns into a tank and spank that's pretty easy from that point on. But now the patch removed the ability to mez him. So you just fight him and tap his mana on the way. Bards typically keep up water breathing and AoE mana tap song during this fight. Otherwise, it's not that bad. It's one of my favorite fights because bards take the cake for the utility here. And I actually got the server credit for the kill. I think the first person to engage gets their name in the announcement. And now the last real raid of Classic, Plane of Sky. Dominion of Vishan, the mother of all dragons like Vox and Nagafin. This is a long raid. I bet when you guys heard playing the sky you probably clicked off or something. This raid really burns people out because it overstays its welcome. How playing the sky works, it's a series of islands you progress through and you need a quest piece that drops off a certain trash mobs on each island. Then you turn in the quest piece to an insane halfling called Siren to get the key to the next island up. But Siren does not spawn until the island's boss is killed. Now all the bosses are fairly easy, except one. Probably the hardest boss of classic, harder than Dracolich. The most common thing bosses do here are death touches, just insta kills whoever has aggro. But I'm going to skip to the notable parts. I don't want to show this whole raid. It's boring. So what is the hardest raid boss? Bee Island. Looks simple because there's only three bees, right? Not really. These bees continually split in half with each kill. And the halves get harder and harder. You really have to make sure your raid is on the same page. Because this fight can turn bad quick. The bees hit like a truck. So at first I'm playing poison resist for the poison dots. They can land on the tanks. You kill one bee at a time while you keep the other ones mezzed. Eventually, they stop splitting, you, you kill the last one and it's over. You save the third bee for the end. It's the hardest fight. You first get a tiny Bixie, then it's a big Bixie. And that's the fight. So with the big one, I have to swap poison resist for disease resist. I also try to maximize hit point regen. This one has a nasty AoE disease dot. It just shreds through the raid. Also hits like a truck, sort of like Dracolich but on steroids. Our first attempt did not go well. Amazing attempt though, this is our first time. The hardest boss of Classic and we got it down to 9%. Undergeared, mind you. Our next attempt days later, we crushed it. Skipping ahead, the boss of the last island. The Eye of Vishan. Not that hard of a fight. If you beat the Bixie, you can easily mop up the rest. The Eye went down, and we beat Classic EverQuest.
Now, in the first episode, I said this. I can honestly say that this series taught me the best way to enjoy EverQuest. So what is it? We raided for a few weeks, and the plan for a static group was to continue on in Kunark Post. But that didn't happen. Almost everyone in the group ended up quitting entirely or dropping the guild. Raiding became tedious, fighting other players and chrono farmers became the norm, playing EverQuest became more irritating than fun, and Resurgence was an okay guild, but it's just not the culture many of us were looking for, putting it kindly. This guild taught me one thing. I didn't realize how good I had it on Mangler with Midnight Rations. And it was really depressing to think that my most fun days of playing EverQuest were behind me. Not to say that Yelenak is a bad server, it just couldn't live up to the nostalgia, to the impossible expectations I had for it. Would I recommend Yelenak or future TLPs for that matter? If getting your epic and doing raids you couldn't do on P99 is all that matters to you, maybe, but for everyone else, absolutely not. Not until Daybreak addresses the root causes of toxicity here. The fans deserve better than this crap. And in the end, I feel like I failed. This series was supposed to show why EverQuest deserves more respect relative to bigger MMOs, why EverQuest social design was such a great feature. But instead, these videos ended up being critical, rants about the state of the game. The P99 episodes were positive, but these TLP ones were dark. And I feel they pushed people away. Above all, I, I try to have integrity, and I feel like I owe you guys my honest opinion. I'd be lying if I ignored the biggest issues ruining our favorite game. When I think back on my time playing here, my best experience was the static group. Teaming up with those guys to get 50 was the most fun I had. Raiding didn't compare to it. The adventure really did beat the destination. And thank you for setting that up, Tabitha. It, it was fitting that Tabitha also ended it. In my opinion, that is the best experience you'll ever have playing EverQuest. That is the best experience you'll have playing any video game. Go through an adventure with a group of friends. Enjoy it while it lasts, though. Because all good things must come to an end. If you're still here, this is probably my last video. EverQuest will always be my favorite game. And I don't want to leave this channel or stop playing, but a huge change has happened. I'm going to be a dad for the first time, and it's time to change priorities. It wouldn't feel right to leave you all in the dark about this. That's why I'm saying it here. This community is so amazing, and I thank you all for the support you've given. And I hope this is just a temporary goodbye. But if it isn't, thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart. Now, how do you get out of the zone? Jump off. Just don't hit a chain on the way down. Seen people die that way. Where do you land? The harbor of Freeport. <laughs>